is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Deadwood, Season 1, Episode 11, Jules' Boot is Made for Walkin'. In this episode, Jewel is looking into getting a brace made so that she doesn't drag her foot behind her anymore, and she's just one of the best humored people I've ever seen, considering what she's dealing with. Also, Alma's dad is in camp. First of all, I would like to register my disbelief that this man has a daughter Alma's age. But sure. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. And uh, yeah, I don't know exactly how old Alma is supposed to be, but I was definitely putting her at like 35, 36. And her father to me looks like he's maybe 50. So I guess he could have a daughter that age, but he just does not look old enough to me. When he's introduced as her father, I was completely distracted for the first like five minutes of the scene because I couldn't reconcile what I was seeing with what I was hearing. He doesn't look, he, she looks older than I think she is. And I don't mean to say that she looks like aged, just, she just doesn't strike me as, you know, a young chicken when, uh, what's his face says, I know I'm too damn old for you. I was like, are you? Because I don't feel like that would be something that would be out of the question to me, the two of them pairing up. I'm not exactly sure if the show has said how old she is or not. Um, And I mean, to be honest, it is kind of refreshing for a show to like normally when you have a cast where the mother looks way, way too young to be the, the mother of whomever the teenage child is. You're just like, oh, of course, because they just cast women who are 30 to be 40 on screen and give us a completely skewed understanding of what it looks like to be 40. Um, But that happening with male characters is pretty rare. Not that it doesn't happen, especially in some like bad movies I've seen. There have been father and son duos that I thought looked like they were brothers. Um, So, yeah, this just. You know, if you guys uh, do not agree with me, that is fine. It's probably a pretty subjective thing. But um, I just found it, like, really distracting initially. And I I just want to talk about what's going on with Alma altogether real quick. I'll get into it um, because, as most of you know, I have the episode playing in another tab when I record on it so that I can go over and, like, read the exact... Um, closed caption of whatever they said so that I know that I'm quoting them exactly correctly. And um, there are going to be some parts of the conversation at the dinner between Alma and her father and Bullock that I thought were just worded in such a way that I don't want to paraphrase them. So I will be getting to that properly at a point. But I just want to address the deal with Alma's father. And I gave him, you know, the story that she tells about him owing money and her getting married the way that she did in order to uh, get help him pay off those debts and him like saying, I can never pay you back, but I can pay them back. Um, I took that as a, a kind of a heartwarming story of a girl who did the only thing that she could do to really help her family and a father who appreciated the sacrifice that his daughter had made and got learned his lesson, got something out of it, realized that like, maybe I need to be smarter or, you know, change my ways. And now that I have met her father, it does not seem like that is the case. This guy is and I the only (laughs) this guy is a huge shyster and the main 
sort of satisfaction that I can get here is the knowledge that he isn't fooling anybody. That at the very least, Alma knows her own father well enough to see what the fuck is happening. Seth is definitely uh, smart enough to see what's happening. Even E.B. watching through the curtain when they're all at dinner. You know, it takes one to know one. E.B. can see all over this guy's face that he's over here about to try and swindle his own kid. And even E.B. is kind of like, that really takes some balls. Like, E.B. is not above swindling his own family. I don't think that's what he's saying. It's like, oh, I'd never stoop that low. I think what it is is that he knows most people wouldn't, that he is maybe unusual in that he would stoop that low. And this guy, it's, you know, not some distant cousin. It's his own daughter. And that is really fucking low. And I just, Alma, it turns out, you know, obviously her father had debts, so that doesn't look good for the family. But I didn't know that Brom kind of went against his family's wishes with this marriage. So apparently now there's this rumor going on that maybe she killed her husband herself, which I don't know if I entirely believe that or not. I can't help but wonder if her father isn't planting that in her head that people are saying it, even though it's not true in an effort to get her to leave the camp, because that feels like what he's here for, right? Is that he found out that she has this really rich gold claim and he's hoping that he can come here and take control of it and send her home and that she'll be too either she'll be too far away, too inexperienced, too unfamiliar to know whether or not she's being swindled and he's pocketing a bunch of the money himself, which really like, it's just so fucking upsetting that Alma can't seem to escape predators, you know, like, thank God she's as smart as she is because, you know, I don't, I feel like a lot of us think that we have a better radar for this sort of thing than we do. And, I don't even mean that we think we'd be able to tell if somebody were swindling us and but we, you know, really wouldn't be able to tell that someone was dishonest. I I almost mean more that we want to see the best in people that we care about and so we don't want to believe what our gut is telling us. So that's like in terms of the radar, I feel like that's not really the correct way to put this. It's more Alma has had enough run-ins with her father to know the truth about him. And as much as she may not want to know that truth, it's happened too many times and it has literally shaped the decisions, major decisions that she's made in her life. And there's no escaping that. But there are some of us who maybe have been preyed on the whole time and aren't even aware that that's been happening. And so to us, well, somebody will continue to prey on us as they always have. And because we still haven't learned to recognize that behavior, it seems normal to us. And just, you know, part uh, part and parcel of how somebody um, interacts with you. So I feel like Alma, at the very least, is aware because, you know, it's such a, like I, I described it as Alma doing the only thing that she really could to help her family, which was to marry someone with money. And that is key, I think, that women only had so many options and marriage was the major one. That, that was how you could change your entire life was by whom you married, which is why so many books set in these periods were focused on who the women married. It was just a huge issue in their lives. And when she told the story about her father and her marrying and saving him there, you know, it wasn't like she went into it without realizing exactly why she was doing what she's doing. I never felt that she wasn't like completely cognizant of the choice she was making, but it was like, when you look at it now, you realize that, this was a sense of real duty for her. This was not like she, I think probably went into it, not only knowing that she was like 
fixing her father's bad decisions, but also knowing that her father was going to continue making those bad decisions. And I don't know if you guys have ever been in that position where you have to continue to like re- relate to someone and be with somebody who has who you know is going to backslide again and you just have to kind of accept that but it can be a huge bummer like it's just you know and i feel really bad that alma had a father who was so unreliable and such a burden in a way to her and then she wound up with a husband who was like similarly a burden that she had to try and manage if she could and I just, in some ways, want Seth to wind up with her simply because I would like her to have an actual partner in her life who's looking out for her and not only concerned about what he can get out of her. Um, so, yeah, in short, I really like Alma and she just deserves better than what the world is giving her and I feel bad about it. But, you know, so do most people. Um, and with that, we'll start at the beginning of the episode because Al Swearingen is hanging out with Trixie. And he's talking about the guy that he stabbed in Chicago. Now, um, I'm going to read this because it was a little bit unclear to me, weirdly. A sl- uh, I'm going to not use the slurs that he used, though. A slob cop in Chicago going to take me off for $35 just because he thinks he can. Because when he comes around for his free fucking meal and to have his pricks sucked and collect his weekly 20 fucking dollars from the woman that runs the whorehouse, I'm there buying girls to bring out to the camps. I knifed the tub of guts. That's what this cunt of a magistrate's shaking me down over. So it was a cop. And this cop was already was shaking down the whorehouse weekly, but... Also, eating free, getting fucked free, and trying to shake down Al, who was like, this was none of their business, but he tried to do it anyway. And uh, Al, you know, phrases it as, I was buying girls, and it's just really like, it's a, a, a completely fair assessment of what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. But in this country, we like to pretend that uh, there were there were options open to people that there really weren't. And outside of chattel slavery, w- taking people out of Africa and bringing them over here, these women were in their own slave situation and still are, really. Like, I don't know if any of them would be free to leave, how that would work. Um, and I'm not comparing their situation to the situation of chattel slaves but it's definitely like human trafficking like in its most basic sense and i just really would like to know more about how if ever any woman could get out of the situation like is that possible because it doesn't seem like any of these women believe that it's possible um you know even Joni who has been assured that she can go out there and make her own start doing something of her own she doesn't seem to trust that really at all um so i just i'm curious about what options were open to women who had to go through this kind of thing um but anyway so that's uh that's the bounty that's on his head for having um for having killed this this cop and he paid that money to supposedly have it lifted and it wasn't lifted so now he has to deal with this and to cut a long story short on this he winds up meeting with silas later and basically making a deal with silas to pay a thousand dollars for silas to kill the magistrate and a thousand dollars to lift the warrant um pretty pretty good deal to silas clearly thinks that he's being robbed but al kind of convinces him to play the long game and to prove that he's actually like worth it before trying to push for more money which i think is probably smart and silas is no dummy and he agrees to it so i do like how like the scenes with silas start off with the uh with eb and doherty and um what's that guy's name johnny 
talking about how Al told him to get a haircut. It looks like your mother fucked a monkey. And, you know, I watched that and was just like, oh, Al. But for all of them, that interaction is really significant. That is how they know that Al likes them is when he like ribs them that way. That's his way of being affectionate. So the fact that he spoke this way to the new guy means that he is like liking this dude in a way that isn't usual for Al with somebody new that quick. And I I really enjoy how EB tries to explain it away and be like, well, he might be just fucking trying to get on the guy's good side and it might not be real. And then he sees them interacting later and is like, fuck. Yep. Cause EB wants to be the guy. And Al knows he can't trust EB. He can't trust EB to not steal from him. But I feel like Al could even deal with that. It's just that he can't trust EB to just do what he's told. And that's a whole other thing. Um, so, yeah, I really... And I don't think EB necessarily has to worry about this dude. I don't think that guy is a threat to him right now. Because EB, ha- he performs a very specific function in the scheme of things, being a hotel owner and being in the camp. This dude's going to be like a go-between probably for a while. Um, But I can understand EB just the fewer people that have Al's confidence, the more power you feel like you have. And EB is nothing if not greedy as hell. So he wants that power for himself and doesn't like to see that getting spread out. Um, so you guys all right i'm gonna i'm gonna try and keep it according to the scenes that are coming up because everything i talk about brings to mind something else there's a scene where jewel walks all the way over to the docks and she has this book and and he thinks that it's a book about the civil war like just about the civil war but it's actually a um diagram of how to build a brace that will help her to walk and she doesn't realize or maybe she does but she's hoping that it'll still give him an idea anyway that this brace is for somebody who got injured and that is what rendered their leg like immovable versus what she's dealing with which is a a birth defect and um He's trying to impress upon her, not to expect that this is going to work, but he does ask her to hold on to, like, asks if he can hold on to the book, and later on, he comes back and speaks to her about it. I, can I just, I love the doc so much. Can I just say that? Like, I know that I do this every single episode, but is he, like, the best person on the show? Like, I certainly like him better than Seth. And as like, I like Seth in a lot of ways, but the doctor is just pure good. He's just, I really, really like this dude. And he gets so irritated, but then like apologizes and is like self-aware enough to realize that it was his problem. And even though he comes out of the gate trying to warn her that he doesn't want to guarantee this will work, he's, you know, he doesn't like just deny her or discount her he takes it seriously thinks it over continues to research and examine and then comes at her and is like okay that might not work but this might work and i love that he like gives a shit enough to worry about this kind of thing it's just really and jewel the woman who plays jewel i don't know if she actually has this you know physical problem um and i say physical because even though she talks strangely, I don't get the impress- impression that there's anything wrong with her mind. There's no, like, um, mental handicap there at all, I don't think. Um, so it's purely that she has trouble moving and speaking clearly. I could be wrong about that. I'm not entirely, you know, sure what exactly it is that she's suffering from. But this actress imbues her with this sort of like doggedness I guess that is so admirable like she's walking down the street and people are making fun of her and just being really brutal and she just kind of looks at them like really like she's fucking dealt with this her entire life and they think they're doing something to intimidate her and she's just like yeah okay and falls down gets her ass up 
again. Nobody helps her up. She gets herself up. And as much as it fucking sucks that nobody offered to help her, the determination that she has is just like really something, you know, I just, I admire this character so much. And I love the fact that the show doesn't make her into like a kind of, what is it that people call it? Like, um, inspiration porn. She is inspiring in her determination, but they don't turn her into a feel good thing for the show. Do you know what I mean? And they also don't take advantage of her and make her the butt of jokes from within the show itself. The jokes are coming from despicable people and we are no watching it aware that it, what we are seeing is meant to be taken as despicable behavior. And also just the inclusion of someone who is, you know, differently abled is really rare, you know, on television. It's just not something that gets, um, acknowledged very much and I find it I find it really interesting that the show's chosen to take on a character like her and have her be more than a background character they are putting her front and center in her own scenes and the scenes are hers they are dealing with her issue things she wants and things she's asking for and trying to get that's unfortunately really rare and i'm kind of excited to see where this goes you know the episode's called jules boot is made for walking but it ends before we ever get to see the boot like we don't really get a uh a an end to that story so it may not really work out very well but i'm hoping it does and i'm hoping that jewel becomes more of a thing because like her interactions with trixie i really like and i like how trixie just treats her like any other woman she's not you know, talking down to her or being shitty to her. Um, so yeah, I, I liked this whole subplot and the doctor's interactions with her and everything. It was just really nice and unusual to see. Um, so I'm going to jump over to, first we have, um, a, a scene of Merrick getting the delivery of his new, uh, camera, which he is very paranoid about. Um, then we have Charlie Utter and Joni having breakfast in the um, the hotel dining room. And I can't with this. Like, it's so funny. The two of them trying to, like, figure out where they fit in all of this, you know. Um, I just really. I am. I don't want to say that I ship them because I don't really, I don't, I don't want everybody who is friends with each other to be for it, for there to have to be like a romantic connection between the two of them. Um, I don't feel like that's a good way to approach the world. I don't love it when, any time that there is a man or and a woman who work together on television that you are waiting for them to get together. And I'm also not a huge fan of any time that there are two men who are good friends that we also have to sexualize that because I feel like there's a kind of um, there's a whole thing with the idea that men aren't able to have intimate friendships without people being really homophobic about it. So I don't want men to see that and to like see that being the way that people react to close friendships and feeling like that precludes them from being able to have those kinds of friendships um, without being seen as potentially romantic partners. But there's something about the two of them. I just, I guess I want them to like go into business together or I want him to like look out for her in a real way. There's just something about the two of them together that feels really comfortable and genial and trusting in a way that I don't see a lot on this show. It's simple comparing of notes and confession of issues and problems that they're dealing with. Um, 
I don't know. I just, I, I want something from the two of them. And I just don't know what that looks like yet. Um, this is when fucking Alma's drinking her coffee and talking to Ellsworth and her father comes in. Now, Ellsworth, right before her dad arrives, Ellsworth is explaining to her that they've gotten basically all that they can from the surface of her claim. And that now it's going to be time for her to sink some shafts and sound the place out. And she's like saying to him that she doesn't want, like he's acting like, well, since this is the end of my expertise, I'm guess I'm going to be out of it. And she's like, you're not going to be out of this deal. Like I want you to supervise everything. Even if you aren't, this isn't your field. You're going to be able to tell whether somebody's fucking lying to me. Like, she just wants somebody that's an agent of hers out there, which is smart. And I think he knows that she, that is smart as well. Um, But yeah, this whole thing is really, like, going so well until her fucking dad has to come in here and ruin the damn thing. I get so mad about it. Like, I just want her father. I don't. Uh, like I said, my one comfort is the fact that. Everybody seems to know that he's full of shit. Um, I just checked, by the way, how old Molly Parker is. Molly Parker is the woman who plays Alma when this is filming. And she is 32 years old. So if her father looks like he's 50, I guess he would only have had to be 18 when he fathered her. So it's not impossible. It's just a... Uh, the the appearance is close enough that I would never have thought that they were that he was old enough to be her dad but nevertheless we'll move on and I'll accept that um so here here her father arrives and makes things really awkward between her and Ellsworth let's talk about the thing that I keep on not wanting to talk about which is the reverend <sighs> So Andy, who has recovered from his illness, it turns out that he's been like kind of wandering around and just getting in trouble in terms of like spending all of his money gambling. And he was wandering around because he wanted to be out of the camp that Sai was in for understandable reasons. But it doesn't turn up anything good for him. And he feels like he's not being like there's no meaning. And he comes back to the camp to continue to volunteer in the pest tent because that was where he felt like he was at least doing some good. But when he arrives, the pest tent is being broken down. They've really pretty much dealt with the outbreak and it's over. And um, the Reverend is there, you know, just kind of like hanging on to a pillar for support. He's in a really bad way. And Andy asks him, he, he relates his issue and feeling of like aimlessness and asks the reverend to help him pray. And the reverend begins a prayer and looks like transported for just a moment and then forgets the rest of the prayer. And it is really heartbreaking, both on behalf of the reverend, for whom this has meant so much to his life, and now he can't even remember. And also to poor Andy, who came to this man and made himself vulnerable for a second looking for help and admitting he didn't know what to do and to only be like faced with somebody who gives like half a prayer and then walks away as much as it's not the reverend's fault. It comes across as being really like half hearted. Um, so I feel really bad for both of them in this moment because Andy needs something and it, you know, it would be pretty good. Joni teaming up with Andy. Um, I would enjoy that, but I don't know that I don't know how close they are. It seemed like she liked the guy, but I don't know if he has any capital to put up in the first place. Um, but yeah, the Reverend, the rest of the episode is kind of wandering around. He's preaching at an oxen or a cow or something. I don't know the difference between oxen and cows, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, but he's preaching at this animal in the middle of the street about being circumcised. And he, I swear to God, he says circumcised and circumcision and uncircumcised like 600 times during the course of this little monologue. And Al is watching him the whole time. And Al 
his reaction to this reverend is really interesting. We don't know exactly what happened with Al's brother. And he said that his brother had fits. But, you know, we don't know if that was because he was epileptic or if he was, like, having reactions to things or if there was something else going on or it was a tumor, like what apparently is going on with the reverend. And there is something about him talking to himself about what he is going to do with the reverend that makes me feel like there's some real heavy baggage there. The fact that he talks about growing up in this orphanage and the way that he was dumped there by his mother and this woman waking them up with the cowbell in the morning. And that talk is interspersed with his manic talk about the, uh, the reverend and maybe that it's time to put him out of his misery. And I say manic because that whole monologue is an owl that we have never, ever seen before on this show. First of all, Al is somebody who does, like, I know that Al drinks in the show all the time. But this episode, Al has a bottle in his hand from almost the moment he wakes up until the moment he goes to bed. Goes through, too. I feel like that's out of character. And then he's walking back and forth, pacing and talking a hundred miles an hour, which is also really rare for him. He is a determined... Pla like placid's not the word I want. Deliberate. He is a deliberate man, and this kind of like train, like train of consciousness, stream of consciousness. That's the word I want. Stream of consciousness, train of thought, monologue. This is not what we see from him almost ever. I don't think. So I feel like there's something going on here where I'm wondering if something happened with his brother at the orphanage. And he feels like he has to do something about the reverend because of what happened to his brother. Like maybe his brother, like the cowbell triggered his friggin seizures or the, uh, the woman like beat him to death because he was having a, or just didn't handle it properly. Um, there's just a sense of personal responsibility for the preacher that Al has that does not feel like business. This is not the Al that's doing something cold blooded and practical for the sake of streamlining his own business. This is something that he is having an emotional reaction to and does not know how to process. And so he's drinking and getting a blowjob at the same time as he's talking this out and like, basically, he's doing everything he can to calm himself the fuck down. Um, and I just, the way that he treats that poor girl in that scene as well is just super gross. I mean, you know, yikes. Um, Al is really such a great character. Sometimes I kind of, like, respect him, and other times I'm like, you are just such trash. Um, but anyway, yeah. What so I'm very curious for more background on Al and uh his brother because I do think there's something tying him to the reverend in his mind. Um anyway, okay. So, we're going to move on to um Al meeting with Silas and you know, everybody realizing that the two of them are friends now that there's a new player in town that they're going to have to uh deal with i would like to register my approval first of all of silas's haircut um titus welliver i know i mentioned him or like last time because i just find his name to be so great but he is such a a good looking man in such a strange way and when i see still pictures of him i'm always just kind of like nah I guess. But every time I see him in something, I'm kind of like, oh, there it is. It's he's one of those that it's not until he's moving and talking and you get the like sort of gravity of him that you start to appreciate the attractiveness. And there are a lot of people out there like that, that I'm like, 
watching something, I'm thinking, God damn, they are attractive. And then I go to like look up a photo of them because I want to send it to somebody and be like, do you see how hot they are? And all the photos just do not seem to do them justice at all. Um, But yeah, this scene is pretty funny just for one reason. And that is Jewel comes over and she brings coffee and he asks her why she went to the dock. And she gives him this big grin and then just goes, I'm knocked up and walks away. And I fucking died. I love her so much. Oh, my God. That was so funny to me. And the way that, like, Al just stares at her, like, he really just doesn't know what to make of this. He later is like, "Ah, I think that was just her sense of humor. But it was very amusing to me. Uh, I like anything pretty much that kind of puts Al off his balance. Um, so, okay. Let, here we go to the scene where Alma is in her room and her father comes up and is hanging out with her and the little girl, Sophia. Uh, he does one of those things where he like, oh, what's this behind your ear? And he's got a, um, a coin. And she gets a look on her face when he does this. Um, I don't, I don't know what that is that she associates that moment with, but it definitely looked pained and a little bit wary. Like it wasn't that she hadn't, of course, when her father shows up without letting her know he's coming, apparently we don't get the impression that he wrote ahead and told her that this was going to be happening. I think of course, there's gotta be some bit of suspicion that immediately comes to mind. But when specifically he hands this girl a coin, the look that Alma gets on her face is such that, it, 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 I don't know if it evokes a memory or something, but there's it, that's just a real moment for her. And I can't, I just don't know what that's about. If it's a combo of like there being a memory for her there, and it doesn't seem like it's a pleasant memory, even though you'd kind of think it would be. You'd think that if somebody's like used to come up to you as a little girl and be like, oh, found this behind your ear, that that would be like a sweet thing that you'd be like, oh my God, I remember when he used to do that with me when I was little, I forgot all about that kind of thing, you know? But she doesn't look happy about it. So, ah, I don't know what that means. And when she like asks him what he's doing here, he just says, I hope I'm here to help in a way that feels like him saying, who knows which way the wind's going to blow and I don't want to do anything shitty, but I know that I might. There's a sort of abdication of responsibility there to me. She hands, he asks if she has any of the gold and he hands it to her or she hands him the like lump that they've got. And she gets a look on her face then when he brings it to the light and examines it as if she's really kind of aware that he's here for this not for her i feel bad for her i think she wants to believe that her father just cares about her and is worried about her but between the way he reacts when she hands him this rock and the way that he starts to walk out of there with it still in his hand (sighs) and this is when he circulates that rumor i feel like this is made up i just He seems like a fucking con man. And when he turns around and hands her back that rock, he like puts it right in her hand and kisses her on the cheek. And she does that thing where you offer somebody your cheek in such a way as to be like, I'm not going to resist this, but I don't really want it. Her body language is just all over the place in this, in this scene. Um, and the conversation that they wind up having later, I'll, You know what? I'm just going to jump ahead and talk about that right away because it is so incredibly awkward. You guys, I can't help but laugh just thinking about it because what they did was rented out the entire restaurant for dinner, which maybe him handing the coin 
to this little girl, maybe it was enough money that it felt like he's gone back to being really reckless with money again. I can't help but wonder, maybe that's what it is. Because he rents out the entire restaurant, which is obviously like, or yeah, it looks like it rented out eat elsewhere. So that feels like there is really, he's throwing money around in a way that might not be smart. Um, but yeah, she's sitting right there and her father is talking to Seth exclusively about what's going on with her and whether Seth thinks that they should like that she should stay in camp. And she keeps trying to insert herself. Insert herself makes it sound like she's doing something that she shouldn't be doing. Uh, she keeps trying to reestablish that she is fucking there. And he does not want to involve her in this discussion. He wants her to sit back and let him do what he needs to do. And I just can't deal with how insulting it is, not only that he thinks that she would do this, sit back, but that he wants her to be that foolish. Like that he just her what's good for her is of no interest to him and it's just really sad and the fact that he thinks that she would ever just let him walk waltz in and walk all over everything it just speaks not highly of what he thinks of her and she has to kind of defend seth at one point too because he says something about how like oh um people seem to think you're trustworthy for some reason and she's like well yeah we have um we rescued this little girl from like, you know, the uh, wreckage of her abandoned family and property. And when he asks how they meted out justice to the man who did it, can I just tell you the way that Seth says we shot him making dead on fucking eye contact with her father fucking Seth knows the deal with this guy, man. He knows. And it's a beautiful little moment of like, yeah, I shot him. And I have very steady hands and I don't regret it. And I will do what I need to do. And you should know that. And Alma gets this little quirk to her mouth. Like she's trying not to laugh in that moment. And it is very, very deeply satisfying. I love it so much. I loved I any moment that Seth can get in there and tell her in so many words, tell her father to back the fuck off. I'm here for because the way like her dad comes and introduces himself to Seth at their store to ask him to come to dinner. And he also handles Saul in a way that feels like he doesn't want to involve Saul and invites him to dinner out of, you know, out of politeness, because Saul is standing right there when he invites Seth, and so he feels like he has to. I don't know, because it seems like um, Al could tell that Saul is Jewish from the second he meets him. I don't know if her father can tell the same thing and has any like feelings or prejudices about that, but I would be willing to bet that was supposed to be playing a little part in what was happening there. Um, and then we have the uh, moment where E.B., like brings out the uh, steak and potatoes and carrots and like announces to them all exactly what it is and what's going to be for dessert and everything later. And he drags it all out and she can't stand to be around him. The fucking look it's, she immediately says to her father as he walks out of there that he, she thinks this man was involved. Um, EB trying to make this place into this grand little restaurant is just incredibly cringy. Oh God. He's really good. That actor. Um, so in the end, what goes, what winds up happening is that Seth goes and walks alone with her father and she is left in the room with Sophia. And she is aware that they seem to be out there like, discussing her fate 
he hints, he basically says to Seth, if you want to have an affair with my daughter, I don't have a problem with that because I want to see her looked after. It's weird because I'm not, I had assumed that he wanted her out of camp. And if he wants Seth to have this kind of relationship with her, I, she would have to stay in camp, right? Um, they're talking, let's see. I certainly recognized his doting infatuation. He's talking about Brahm. I'll admit that I had hoped she might find a man who would dote on her and more, perhaps had a surer sense of what the world was. And apparently I'm entitled to hope that again. And this is when Seth says my wife and son will be joining me soon. I'm long past judgment, Mr. Bullock. And I've learned that no matter what people say or how civil they seem, their passions rule. I see no reason why your wife and son's arrival need alter my hopes for my daughter's happiness or security or the security of her holdings. I don't even quite know what he means by and the security of her holdings. Does he think that he is he trying to like use his daughter to bribe Seth to do something like I'm not clear on this. So, and I just want to put it out there and like admit that I'm not entirely clear what I think he's getting at. Seth is obviously insulted and it could very well just be as, as um, simple as you are prostituting your daughter in a way, you know, like this idea that he can, um, he should want more for her than for her to like be the mistress of some dude. And, That, I think, is insulting to Seth, even though it's in his heart what he wants is to be with her. I can't imagine, you guys. I don't know what exactly his goal is here. Because like I said, I thought he wanted her out of the camp so that he could kind of take control of things. Is this, is this his, his try, like, is he trying to just get her distracted with Seth to get her out of the way of his, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe he just thinks that if she has a man managing her, he will be able to do what he wants to do more easily. But, yeah, I'm just a little confused on this point. I guess we'll see. Um, so, okay, just jumping back a little bit here. We have this dude, Tom Nuttall, who is the uh, the guy who owns, like, one of the little restaurants all across the way. And... Was the it, he owns the place where um, Wild Bill was shot to death, and there is this guy named Con Stapleton, who has this fucking outfit that really just needs to be seen to be believed, and this dude wants to be sheriff simply because of feeling like that would give him some modicum of power and get him to be at least potentially eventually be on Al's good side. Because right now Al hates his guts and he is aware of how much of a um, problem that is in this camp in particular, that you can't have Al hating your guts and hope to get anywhere. So he wants to be the sheriff even though he has like really no interest in upholding the law, this is purely for his own, you know, power reasons and, and hopes for his own enrichment later on down the line. And he, I, Seth has exactly the reaction that I expected, which is, I can't believe that you're giving this job to this guy, but also I can't believe that, you are now asking me if I don't like it to be sheriff instead. He wants it both ways. And I have been there before. I have worked places where the person in charge was not good at their job and clearly not as smart as I was and not as efficient, didn't think things through. But someone asked me if I wanted to take a position that was like a supervisory position. And I was like, absolutely fucking not. No, ew, no. And that's what happens when you're like smart enough to realize that getting into higher management isn't actually 
like it used to be something that you could like work up to a pretty good position but nowadays what they do is they give you like a a tiny raise if you're lucky but often they just give you a title and no raise and twice the work and when you get to a point in your life where you start to realize that this is all an illusion you're just trying to take advantage of me you be, you know better than to take those offers but also if you're that if you're like that aware and smart that you're being taken advantage of you're going to be oftentimes smarter than the people who are being taken advantage of it's just a circle jerk kind of thing so then you want everything to be done the way that you know is smart but you don't want to be the one to have to take responsibility for it because you know it's not worth it not really it's really frustrating so yeah he, his reaction is very predictable and i had to laugh at the way that he handled it like he, first of all he goes into the gem in a bad mood because he walked in on Trixie and Saul having sex. They were having sex in the friggin' like corner of the <laughs> Saul, what are you doing? In the corner of their business with the door unlocked like fools. And I swear to God, I don't know what Saul was thinking. I understand that he likes Trixie and I understand wanting to jump on this. And she's sort of like, we need, she basically says the fact that we have not fucked is distracting me. I want to have sex with you. Can we just get this done and I'll do it for free. And they do. And he wants to kiss her and be affectionate with her in the ways that you do when you are actually emotionally interested in someone. And at first she doesn't want to, but then she does. And, fucking Seth pops off and tells Al about what he just saw. I was so mad at him, y'all. Oh my God. I swear. He comes in talking about the sheriff position and Al saying, now, if you were fucking sheriff and you said, do this, do that, I'd consider it because you're not a fucking whore. I have personal responsibilities. Da, 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 da. Whatever, Seth. Oh, my God. Take the job. We all know you're going to get there eventually. Um, But at the end, when he stands up and says that he doesn't want it, and Al tries to be like, well, I do lots of things I don't want to do. He says, you think you're the only one? Well, <laughs> then just blurts out, the only reason I'm here, the, I'm only talking to you. Because my partner's fucking that whore. And I don't know what possessed him. After he says that, he gets a look on his face like he realizes immediately that he shouldn't have said anything. Especially because of how Al reacts, I think. I I suspect Seth didn't exactly know how important Trixie was to Al. And once he said it and he sees the way that Al like kind of chokes on the shot that he's drinking, he realizes like... Oh, dear. Okay, this is actually maybe gonna get my friend in some trouble. I shouldn't have fuck. And I appreciate that he's up front later with Saul and just tells him, dude, I'm sorry I fucked up. And I told him that you guys were having sex and I know I shouldn't have done it. And I'm, I just, my mouth got away with me and I was irritated and I'm sorry. But, uh, it's, pfft. I just come on, Seth. Jesus Christ. He is too impulsive, man. He can keep it under control a lot of the time, but not enough of the time. Um, and yeah, I just, <sighs> I feel bad about the way that this goes down between Saul and, and Al, because Al makes Saul pay. And says, either you pay or she pays. And of course, Saul is not going to let her get beat up. So he goes ahead and pays it. But it's obvious that he's realizing that, like, maybe things with Trixie are not going to be able to work out. Like, I think he pictured swooping in and scooping her up and taking her away from all this. And he's realizing that that is just, as long as they stay in this camp, not an option. And 
Al tells Trixie that she, he says, you go to sleep with your own tonight. In other words, not only is it I'm kicking you out and I don't want to see you because I'm pissed at you because you betrayed me, but also you're not really a person. So go sleep with the other ones of you. Like there, there's just something so dehumanizing about it. It's really ugly. I get so mad at Al. And the fact that he just doesn't know how to have like a, a an adult affectionate relationship with anybody. And he winds up trying to take it out on the doc later who is not fucking having it. The doc knows I love him so much. He's just basically like, you're just in a bad mood and you're looking for somebody to turn into the reason for that bad mood. And I'm not going to be it. So I'm fucking leaving. Um, but yeah, I just, Al, can't you just like, the thing is that Al doesn't trust anybody. He's too paranoid. So he can't let himself love the way that you want to love people because he doesn't trust enough to do that. And of course he's like taking this thing with Trixie personally. Like, I thought you really cared. Why would you think that Al? Why would you think she really cared about you? You, she is a commodity to you. That's what she is to you. And you expect her to respect and care about you. Like in response, she's scared of you and she's been brainwashed by you being abusive toward her. And that's why she came back. But that's not anything to do with the fact that like, you know, you, she loves you. Uh, it's so gross. Al, you make me really mad sometimes. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up with talking about Cy Tolliver. There are two things going on with Cy. First one is that Cy is uh, spreading around. He's having the, um, the, the other dope fiend who actually survived the whole thing with Mr. Wu is having him rant and rave about the fact that Al handed over a white man to the Chinese. They keep calling them celestials which I have never heard as a, as a slur before. And it's a really, really weird one. Um, basically, I guess, implying that they're like aliens or something. But in any case, the ranting and raving at the bar does not really seem to be working. And I'm guessing that what Sai is trying to do is like lay the groundwork for something and probably either set up Al to do something again that will make him look bad in the community or just let the, just plant the seed and let it do its thing on his own. Um, but it doesn't like people aren't really as engaged with him as I expected them to be. I thought that he'd be able to like nail down a couple of people in a, an actual conversation which I think is what Sai intended for him to do instead of just like wildly performing for everybody at the bar. But uh, I really am not looking forward to where this goes. There's just, there's no good ending for this, you know? And then there's the deal with Eddie. Eddie comes back to work for Sai after being gone for a while, but tells Sai, you need to take it back about what you said about the way I was looking at that boy, which Sai agrees to do. But Eddie is in the middle of talking. Jo Joni comes up to him and tells him that she's still looking for a, a place. And he confides to her that he stole some chips and that Cy didn't even notice. But Cy is standing right behind him when he says that. And I feel like Cy must have heard him. I don't know. I feel like Eddie's not being careful. He seems to be a little bit too sure of himself. And as much as I dislike Cy and want somebody to get the drop on him... I still can't decide exactly how I feel about Eddie. I think in principle, he seems to be a good person, but there's something about him that doesn't sit right with me. And I can't decide what that is. Um, so yeah, the episode ends with the, uh, friggin weirdo blowjob monologue that, that Al gives talking about being at the orphanage. And it was just the weirdest ending. Just, you know, um, yeah, there was a lot in this episode, but it, this episode was more of a bummer than any of them so far, I think. Just a lot of people like letting each other down or being disappointed or feeling like they aren't being taken, uh, that they're being taken for granted or taken advantage of or something. And it just is a shame. So 
But there's one more episode. The finale is next of this season. So I'm dying to find out what happens. I don't know what a season finale for a show like this even looks like. So I guess we'll find out. Um, but thank you to Patrick for commissioning this. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys are all enjoying the coverage. And I will see you soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs> Spoiled Network Podcast.